And if you really study the best flywheels, uh, they have a different role. And so on the, on the right-hand side of the flywheel, the 12 o'clock to 6 is really about what you do in the world, what you do to contribute, what you do that makes people's lives better, what you do that is kind of your net ad, right, in some way. And whether it be delivering great health outcomes, whether it be, you know, the next powerful generation of chips that multiply Moore's law over time, whether it's a a biotech drug that's going to be able to solve anemia, whatever the thing is that you lower, you know, better returns for your investors, right? You're doing something in the world. And then as you come up the other side of the flywheel, what you find is that it's about generating fuel. It's how you convert the 12 to 6. The 6 to 12 takes that and converts it into fuel. I think we're going to start with Bill Lazier and the role of great mentors that sort of changed your life. You said he was the closest thing to a father for you. So I want to start there. What does it mean to be a father? Not in the biological sense. Anyone can do that. But the essence of what it means to be a father. So... In our, in our last conversation, you, uh, when I was looking back on it, I was smiling to myself because I shared the story of going down to New Mexico to try to connect with my real father, my biological father, when he was living in the adobe hut with the dirt floor. And actually, that was the first time I think I've publicly shared that story, uh, mm-hmm. just so you know. Um, and, uh, and so that was kind of like the recognition there was no father. And so then you flip it around. So, so then why, why would I look at Bill Azir as the closest thing to a father I ever had? Or was really a father? So let's just start. Let me, let me, I guess, answer that question a little bit by talking about how I saw Bill as a father, a specific case, and expand that out to what father is about. Um, so I was very fortunate to come across Bill. Uh, I was a... A fortuitous event, um, ending up in his class the first time that he taught at Stanford. And no one knew who he was. I didn't know who he was. Uh, he had had a successful entrepreneurial career and was taking this step of, of kind of a renewed path to really now uh, invest in young people and, and then shift from building companies to building young people, I think, is what was really happening. And Bill took this interest in me. Um, I don't really know why he did. Uh, it's, I I mean, I truly can't give you an answer for that. I don't, I don't think I was a particular standout on it, you know, in, in certain kinds of dimensions, but Bill took an interest in me. And I think that it starts there is a genuine interest, right? It's just basically interested without any agenda. There was no sense of what, that Bill felt, uh, you know, is it's not that he wanted me to like start a company so he could invest in it or, mm. uh, you know, uh, or is going to help him with research or he had no idea that eventually we'd write a book together or any of that. Um, Bill just in, in this tremendous sense of generosity took an interest in me and he would start inviting Joanne and me over to his house. His, his wife, Dorothy, who I'm still in touch with, just spoke with her the other day. Um, uh, we, um, and he would just begin asking questions and he was, he just, he just wanted the best for me, whatever that would turn out to be. But he also had this kind of faith and belief in, in in, that if I found a way to deploy my energies, I could be effective and useful. And, and, and I think that that's, um, uh, that it, it was just this investment that he made without ever asking for a return, right? There was, there was, that's, I think, the essence of it. And then what would happen is uh, he also had this real sense of guidance for me. Um, and, and I think one of the things, so I can, let's just put Bill in contrast to my biological father. And my biological father, who um, I don't need to go into all the you know, ways in which, which he wasn't really a father. But, but one of the ways is Bill would talk to me a lot about values, right? He, he would talk with me about, um, you know, commitments and about relationships and about what are you going to serve? And, 
um, and, and these sorts of things. And, and until I really started having conversations with someone like Bill, and Bill in particular in great depth in my 20s, uh, I had never had a father figure who invested in trying to shape my character. Hmm. And, uh, and, and I, I, I really was impoverished on that. And then Bill stepped in and played that role of helping to shape not what I did career wise, but who I was as a person. And, and if he felt that I, uh, and he would guide, like, you know, he would, he would help me try to see this image I always had was I was a super high energy propulsion machine. Um, but I kind of didn't have a guidance mechanism. I could have just crashed into a cliff or something. And and Bill was helping me build that guidance mechanism that was both kind of in in, in direction and in quality. And uh, and he would he would invest that way. So I think it has to do with being genuinely interested without asking for anything in return and shaping who you are, your character. And 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 you know I um uh. I really, at that point in my life, I was on a journey to create my own father. I mean, that's really, we, you know, we mentioned that last time. I, I really was trying to do that. It's like, I didn't get one, so I'll make one. And Bill was one of the central people in that. I remember this um, coming up with this thing called the Personal Board of Directors. And uh, I was back in the early 80s. And and I made Bill my honorary chairman of my personal board of directors. And when I chose members for my personal board of directors, they were not chosen for their success. Uh, they were chosen for their values and for their character. Can you dive into that a little more? I mean, what I'm thinking about here is that we're, we're all born with parents. We didn't choose them. Some of them are exceptional. Some of them are average and some of them are terrible. And that's not to place anybody in any of those buckets, but this is what you grow up in and you get this environment and you, you get these habits, you, you assume these habits from your parents and that's the patterns that you learn as children. And then at some point you take over your life and you get to choose your habits and patterns, whether you recognize it or not, you, you can take control. You can pick your own personal board of directors. You can pick your mentors and those mentors need not be alive. Um, you know, we can, we can sort of choose them and we can choose to have the best mentors from history. What's the approach to pick the right ones? Well, so, uh, first in, in, in my own case, um, I think, my experience was maybe both. I had to start choosing early, and uh, and I, uh, I think my initial choosing was to get away, um, to react to 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 not be uh, uh, you know, have to depend on something like an undependable father, um, and you know I. I mean, no one in my family gave me guidance about where or what I should do or how I should think about things. So I think this question of sort of self-direction and self-choice and self-molding for me started, gosh, I was 13 or something, probably when it was really conscious that it really began. And there were some pivotal moments in that for me where I just like, I'm just going to do this. This is what I'm going to do. So, um, but then uh, when I when I entered uh, my 20s, uh, I, uh, when I think about, kind of choosing mentors and, and creating a father, I, I, did, I did three things. Um, the first was that I just made a simple goal. I'm going to read 100 biographies. And I figured that by reading 100 biographies, uh, I would get 100 lives. And those lives uh, would, uh, would teach me something. The beauty, beauty of biographies is you get an entire arc of people's lives, right? And, and so you don't just see them at moments or incidents. And I sat down and uh, we got one, of the, one of the ones that, I, uh, that, that, that shaped me a lot was, was you know, Churchill's memoirs uh, of the Second World War, 4,996 pages, six volumes. Uh, it completely shaped the way that I think about how you guide through the tumultuous, horrendous times and and I tried to you know take the best of you know Winston Churchill as a as a guide, uh, and then I would move on. And sometimes they were they were folks that 
were just, you know, just interested. It might just take one thing from them. And all, and then, and then that sort of led to the second part of the personal board of directors. And I remember very vividly, I was, I was driving down Alma Street in Palo Alto. And, uh, and I've always been a very audio person. I don't take words off pages very well. So when I, when they finally started to be audio books, man, I, my, my learning just accelerated exponentially. And I was listening to an audio book called Plain Speaking. And Plain Speaking was uh, basically transcripts and consolidations of interviews that a guy named, I think, Merle Miller had done with Harry Truman. And uh, Truman uh, had this one line in there, which was, the only thing I know for certain is if you don't know the difference between right and wrong, by the time you're 30, you never will. And I like literally made a right turn, pulled off the side of the road and sat there and thought to myself, I was in, you know, some, somewhere in my early to mid 20s. I got like five years to figure this out. <laughs> so, I mean, it was a really close to a moment. It's like, how am I going to do that? Right. Because I, I really didn't want to get I, I really wanted that. And so uh, that's when this idea of I'm going to create a personal board of directors. And I'm going to put people on that board who I um, admire for their character, right? They're the sorts of people I wouldn't want to let down. And, uh, and, and so I drew a little diagram of a, like a board table and I put seven seats around it. And of course, Joanne had one. Bill had one. Bill was my, my first sort of non-Joanne choice. And then I, then I filled out the rest. I put that, that piece of paper above my desk. And whenever I'd be in situations, I'd look up to that piece of paper and there'd be those seven seats, you know, and mm-hmm. I could picture, um, I mean, it was literally like their names were there. Uh, and, and it was like this guidance mechanism and it didn't look to it for like, you know, how to be successful. That wasn't what the personal board was about. It was this like moral compass, and uh, this sense of, you know, what's a, what's a richer values-based life based on these people. So then that was the, the second part. So biographies, then the personal board of directors. And then the third was very conscious um, getting the highest possible um, making, how do I want to put it, um, really, really growing from mentor moments. And, uh, and just, uh, if I had a wonderful mentor moment, it might've only been a day or an hour, or it might be like with Bill where it was day after day, after day, after day, uh, for years, but I would, those mentor moments were like, they were like sapphires. They're just pure drops of gold. And I wanted to, um, have those be like these seeds, these kernels that would, would affect me for the rest of my life. And, and, and I have sought mentors it's evolved and and I, and so I had the personal board directors. And then as I gotten older, uh, the interesting thing is that um, most of my personal board members are now deceased, um, including Bill. And, and so I started thinking now that I'm in my sixties, how do I, begin to also have that same mechanism. And I, I've, I've evolved it. It's no longer a personal board of directors now that I'm in a different stage of life. I, I have my personal band of brothers. Mm. And, uh, and these, are, these are people in my life. S- some of them are, are, are women, but it's sort of this band of brothers idea. And there's these people in my life that, again, I wouldn't want to let down. Some of them are younger than me, quite a bit younger. Um, some of them are, are about my age. And, uh, and I, when I text them, you know, it's brother, Tom, brother, Kyle, right. My personal band of brothers, the people who would hold me to account, the people I would not want to let down. I think that's a powerful approach. I want to dive into some of those mentor moments specifically with Bill and some mm-hmm. of the, the lessons that you've, he helped instill in you. Yep. One was relationships, not transactions. Mm. Yeah. So, um, uh, so, so, you know, Bill, uh, and, and we write about this in, in this, uh, Beyond Entrepreneurship 2.0, which co-authored with Bill and big part of the reason why we're talking about Bill is I re-released this book with a chapter about Bill to really honor Bill and extend his legacy. And, and he died in 2004. Um, and I knew I wanted to write something about him and the profound impact he had on me. And I wanted to, 
distill the lessons of this truly great mentor, but kind of basically multiply them as many times as I could uh, by sharing Bill with the world. And it was Joanne's idea to, to do the re-release because um, I'd always wanted to write something about Bill. And, and Joanne said, you know, why don't you re-release Beyond Entrepreneurship, which was, you know, with some new material, but really bring it out to share Bill with the world. And that would be the best way to honor him and to contribute. He, he would love that he is that he is mentoring, even though he's no longer here. And so that that was a huge part of, of wanting to do this. Not the only part, but a huge part. So in that in there, there are some lessons. And one of them is this, this notion of relationships. So if I if I stand back and I think about what are my absolute most primary values um, and, and particularly ones that I got from Bill. Um, if I had, if you force me to pick just two core values in my life that dominate above all others, uh, they are curiosity and relationships. And the curiosity, I think, has kind of been with me all the way along, but the relationships when I got from Bill. And um, Bill's basic view of the world was, you know, number one, life is short. Uh, you never know when it's going to go away. And in the end, um, what does that up to, right? What is meaningful? And Bill believed that people break into two buckets. There are those who kind of come at life as a series of transactions. And there are people who come at life as building relationships. And Bill believed that the only way to have a great life, you can have a successful life doing transactions, but the only way to have a really great life is on the relationship side. And so Bill just pounded in me, instilled in me, modeled for me that in the end, it is really deep relationships and doing things you love with people you love and, uh, and, and those connections. And so we got into this conversation, though, about relationships one day. And I asked Bill, so, okay, but, so what makes for a great relationship? And Bill said, oh, a really great relationship is one where if you ask each person independently who benefits more from the relationship, they would each say, well, I do. And I said, well, isn't that a little bit of a selfish way to look at it? And he said, well, no, let's think about this for a minute, Jim. Let me ask you, um, Jim, who do you think benefits more from our relationship? And I said, well, clearly I do. I mean, with everything you've done for me. And he said, well, isn't that just great? Because I would answer that I do. And, uh, you know, with, uh, with the work that we've done together, with how you kind of, you know, uh, uh, continue to bring out of me a, a desire to, to, to teach and to teach better and so forth. And we, we talk back and forth about these different elements and, and the sheer joy of our time together. And, um, and, what, and, what, and he said, see, the reason both people can answer that way is because both people are putting uh, – into the relationship, not for what they're going to get from it, but for, for what they can give to it. Mm -hmm. And because both people are doing that, both people would feel that they are the ones who are the ultimate beneficiary because of how much the other person gives. And I think that, you know, for me, that was like, wow, okay, so that's what a great relationship is. It's not what you get, it's what you give. And, uh, but over a long period of time, and everything we do here at the Good to Great Project is relationship oriented. I mean, there's not a single day that goes by that we don't think about what is the relationship element of this decision of how we handle something of whether we say, how we say yes or no, everything goes back to relationships. How do you use that in your life constructively? Like, do you get out of relationships where you feel like you can't contribute to them or people are, are sort of transactional or? Well, uh, that's a, that's a wonderful question from the standpoint of, um, you know, I've always, uh, you know, thought a little bit about, as, as you know, one of my approaches to discipline when I'm an enormously disciplined, or I try to be a disciplined person. I certainly write a lot about discipline. But I think the essence of discipline is uh, not doing more, but doing less. And it's not about a to-do list. It's about having a stop doing list. And you just trigger something in my mind is, you know, how do you think about who you should, you know, who should be on that list too, right? And um, 
I, I think that there's sort of a mirroring aspect, right? That if, if you invest in a relationship and somebody invests in return, it becomes, it's kind of a relationship flywheel, right? And, uh, and you may not always be in touch with each other, you know, constantly, but, but there's always, uh, um, you, you really feel that, that sense of, of, you know, connection that comes from, um, you both putting into it, right. Even if you don't talk all the time and, and then, you know, it's this whole thing with mentoring is always a little troubling to me because like, for example, I don't think you can assign a mentor. I don't know how that happens. Like you're going to mentor this person. That sounds very transactional to me. Or when you have uh, people who they, they really view that what mentoring is about is I'm trying to make connections. I'm trying to make my way in Silicon Valley. I'm trying to get into the finance community. I'm trying to, you know, I really need somebody to open doors for me. I need somebody. That's not mentoring, right? That's networking. That's a whole different thing. That's very transactional. Um, and when, when, um, what I over time have, have, I guess I don't have a lot that end up on the, on the stop list for the simple reason that I think over time I've developed a very intuitive sense for relationship oriented people and my energy mm. just tends to go there. So you filter them just naturally, like unconsciously. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, you can tell if you sit down and have a conversation with somebody is, is there a, is there a connection? And, and, and then I think the, you know, the, the, um, the other, the other aspect is I think great relationships tend to last a really long time. And so part of what I, I think happens is this, this notion that you, you know, you spend more and more time with people that you've spent time with over time mm -hmm. because those relationships deepen. I, mean, I have friends that go back to third grade. Yeah. Uh, I, I totally, I, I see that and I feel it and it, it's sort of like an intuitive thing, but I, I always, it's almost like a red flag when I meet somebody who's, who's, you know, older or, you know, above 30 and just doesn't have any friends. And it, it's so strange to me and so foreign and yeah, it, it's so, it's so weird. And those, ten, those type of people just tend to be transactional people. And, uh, you know, they have a lot of friends, but they're like Facebook friends. They're not real friends. You can't call them and bury a body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I, I think what's, what's really um, interesting to me when you say somebody who doesn't really have friends, like, wow, that just, I can't imagine. I honestly can't imagine a life that I, I feel that friendship it ultimately bill was of course a mentor, but there's at some deepest, deepest level friendship and friendship is one of the greatest arts. Hmm. Um, and yeah, it's, French you want to you want to celebrate life with the people that are close to you, right? And I yeah. think that there's an important aspect to that. One of the other lessons you you learned from Bill um, was the trust wager. Talk to me about yeah. that. Well, so th this is a this is a very interesting one because, uh, so there's the, so Bill, uh, Bill had this really interesting stance on trust that ultimately affected me. And so let's make this both human and and, and intellectual. So when I, uh, when I left Stanford to launch out on my own and in our last conversation, you know, I described <laughs> launching out on my own and the, the fear of that and the commitment and so forth. And, and, uh, uh, and, and when I sort of left the relatively cloistered world of a place like Stanford, you kind of hit a broader world and um, certain assumptions about how trustworthy people are might get dashed by events. And I, I don't want to call people out on this, but just, just suffice it to say that to my great shock, I discovered that some people actually genuinely weren't trustworthy hmm. and, I, and, and they abused my trust. And I'm, I'm, I was I mean, I'm just naive in some, in some level, right? But you know, when I've had people like, you know, Bill Lazier in my life, or I'd met people like Jim Stockdale or, you know, uh, Peter Drucker, or people, people that just, you know, they're just of such a character caliber that I was in a very 
rare group of, of folks. And, and so I asked Bill, I was really struggling with this. I said, Bill, how do you deal with this? How do, how do you deal? Uh, have you ever had your trust abused? And he said, oh, yeah, of course. I've, been, I've, I've had my trust abused. Uh, it's just part of life. And I said, well, uh, but, he, but then he gave me this, you know, this was one of this great mentor moment. He said, this is, Jim, this is one of, now that you're starting to have this experience and really experience it, this is one of the most important forks in life, one of the most important decisions you need to make for the rest of your life. You need to decide what is your opening bid uh, when you are establishing a relationship with someone, when you're interacting with the world. Is your opening bid to assume trust, to assume that someone is trustworthy, and to grant them the full benefits of that? Right? That's your opening bid. And that trust can be lost, but the bid is trust. Or is your opening bid to not trust, but the trust can be earned? And he said, and he said that, that so many aspects of your life will be affected by which fork on that you take. That's a stance on life. And I said, well, it seems to me, Bill, you've chosen the trust bid as the opening bid. And he said, yes, I have. I said, but, but Bill, brutal facts. The brutal fact is not everyone is trustworthy. And the brutal fact is some people will abuse that trust. So have people abused your trust? And he said, of course they have. And he went on and he described a situation of somebody who was quite close to him uh, who um, had abused his trust and it had cost him enough that he said it hurt, right? Not just emotionally, but financially as well. And, uh, and, then, and then there's this little kind of cul-de-sac on the whole thing that Bill has, which is the notion of, you know, that, that you, you don't leave yourself exposed to a, a catastrophe, right? In such a way that if you, if you trust your, let's say your, your CFO and you never look at the books and then you discover one day that you had a problem and your, you know, your company is bankrupt, you, know, you, you always pay attention to the cash flow. You always watch the numbers. You always keep an eye on things. Like you, you don't, it's not like you become disconnected from reality, but he said, but you know, um, uh, so I, I, I never left myself open to catastrophe. But beyond that, yeah, that, that one hurt. I said, well, did it change your, your approach to trusting people? He said, no, it's just part of the cost of living. And then he went on and he described it as upside and downside. And this is, it sort of gets into the, you know, it just simply hard-headed. This was a hard-headed view. He said, I've come to the conclusion when I think across the iterative relationships and interactions and aspects of life, that there is far more upside in an opening bid of trust and there is far more downside in an opening bid of mistrust. And, and, he, and, he, and he summarized it as it all goes to the question of people. If you really basically want to have your life, whether there be people in your company, whether they be people in your life, whether they be your friends, whether they be people you rock climb with, whatever it is, right, that uh, the very, very best people will respond to the bid of trust. That if you trust them, and Bill trusted me, I mean, he went to bat for me to teach at Stanford when I... Yeah, I mean, he, he trusted that I would do everything I could to come through. And he was totally on the line for me, took a risk for me, right? But he trusted. And, and uh, but his view was that if you trust people, the best people will be attracted to that. And, and you want the best people to be attracted. And the second is, he said, have you ever considered the possibility, Jim, that your opening bid affects how people behave? If you trust people, you're more likely that they will act in a trustworthy way. So it's a double win. It's the best people and they'll behave trustful in a trustworthy way. The flip side is if you have an opening bit of mistrust, the best people will not be attracted to that. The best people, you, you won't, you know, if, if you have this opening sense of you have to earn my trust. Now, you may have to earn my trust how good you are at something, 
right? Or earn my respect for your performance or that sort of thing. But if you, if I basically like, I don't trust you, you have to earn it. Well, some of the best people are going to be like, I don't need to put up with that. I'll go do something else. And for Bill, it was always about, again, people and relationships, right? That That's where the trust trust comes from. And, and he just came at it as a, um, as a very hard headed and warm hearted approach to the world. And that's why I think there were so many people whose lives were affected by Bill Azir. He trusted them and they responded in very trustworthy ways in the world. Now the, the, the other thing though, that on an intellectual front on this is I, uh, as I, I think, you know, I'm a huge fan of this thing called the great courses series where you get college level courses, 60 lectures, 40 lectures, whatever. And I've been doing them for years and years. And there's one called games people play. And it's a course on game theory. And of course I know, you know, game theory well, but I, you know, I always try to look for one idea that just stays with me for life. And what I remember in the summary lecture of that class, if I, if I remember right, I hope I'm not embarrassing myself and getting my game theory wrong. But if I remember it right, the essence of it was that um, in that the best strategy is an opening bid of cooperation. Now, the game can unfold from there, right? But that that is, you know, a good place to start. So I was very sort of like Bill had this sense of game theory that was in his approach to relationships and humanity. I don't know if he ever took a course on game theory. I think that's a really interesting way to approach it. And I definitely agree with, with that personally. And my, my friend Toby has this concept that I think might help people. It's very visual. It's called the trust battery. And you can do things that increase your trust or decrease your trust. But if you start mm-hmm. that trust battery at, say, the 75th percentile, um, then, you know, you're starting from a different place than if it's the fifth, you know, mm. your 5%, uh, yeah. your trust battery is full. And it's been my experience that the benefits of reciprocal trust and the speed and not living with your guard up all the time is more than worth letting yourself occasionally get screwed. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it happens. And I had and a, a, another friend of mine had this really good concept about when to forgive and when to sort of like, and he said, as long as it's not malicious, just always forgive. Yeah. And, and that's interesting. And I want to ask you a question about that uh, here in a moment. One of the things that, um, uh, that, that Bill always emphasized was that sometimes you don't know the whole story. Yeah. And, um, and you, uh, he said, sometimes it may not be ill intent. It could just simply be a misunderstanding, right? Or it could be just incompetence, right? Somebody might not actually be untrustworthy. They might just be incompetent and have messed something up out of incompetence or they made a mistake, right? And so be careful. There's this um, uh, this moment, I call it seeing the hat. It's a, it's a weird thing, but uh, driving down a road in, in Boulder, and, and, and imagine a car all of a sudden you know, veers into your lane from the, the lane next to you. You're, you're you know, both going the same direction and you're like, oh, you know, idiotic driver or whatever. And then um, you notice that what had happened was uh, when you went on past further is somebody's hat had blown off in the middle of the road and they were going to maybe step out and grab it. And, but you couldn't see that. Mm-hmm. And the person had veered so that they wouldn't, okay, um, I think I, I think Joanne had this experience, and you sort of think about it as like, well, wait a minute, you know, maybe you don't see the whole situation. You're jumping to a conclusion about why somebody is doing something, when actually, if you can see the hat, you'll look at it a little different. Yeah, perspective is everything, right? Yeah. Speaking of perspective, one of the things that I, that I got out of reading the, the updated version of this was how we confuse living a long life with living a great life. You want to talk to me about that? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so b- before we do that, let me just pop back and ask you a question because you, you put something out there that I found very provocative. And if you don't mind, I would just like to, to ask about it. And sure. then we'll talk about long life and short life. Forgiveness. Okay. Um, what do you think it means to forgive? Thank and you. do you think it's hard? Go ahead, please. No, sorry. What were you going to say? No, I was just going to say, and do you find it harder to forgive yourself or to forgive others? Oh, definitely harder to forgive me. I think, you know, forgiveness just means letting it go, right? And if you don't assume malicious intent on people, um, it's a lot easier to let it go. And we create these stories in our head about how people are, you know, 
doing things to get us at work. And, you know, it's just nobody really cares. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, nobody's walking around trying to hurt you. And maybe there is the occasional person, but it's not worth living life like that. And I think that when people in your life that are close to you that you trust and you're vulnerable with do um, let you down in some way, then, you know, the, the default should be to forgive them unless it's intentionally trying to hurt you and it's malicious. Um, but when it comes to, I, I'm probably the same as most of my listeners. I mean, I have exceptionally high standards of myself. I can't go listen to our past conversation because, you know, like you, I'm yeah. like, oh my God, I could have worded that so much better. Or I could have said that yeah. more succinctly, or I'm just always sort of like the inner critic in me is, is mm -hmm. raging or not raging, but out of control in some ways. And mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, I find it really hard to forgive myself when I have lapses mm. in judgment and we all do, mm -hmm. we're all human. I mean, that's part of what it means to be human. Yeah. And I think that we need to understand that and perspective helps us see that not only do we do that on occasion and we, we hope that other people would forgive us because we're not maliciously trying to get them, but other people, have, uh, they're in the same boat. I mean, we're, mm -hmm. especially right now, we're all just trying to do the best we can. Nobody's at their best. The tolerance for, you know, what other people are going through just has to be higher and you have to put yourself in other people's shoes. So you can realize that. Yeah. You know, it, it's, um, it's interesting. Uh, the, oh, one, the, the self-critic part. And I, um, that, that I have the same experience you do, which is that, uh, you know, of course for this, I needed to go back and, and look at our, look at our transcripts so that we could think about what we'd want to talk about that we haven't talked about to share with your, 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 uh, your listeners. Um, but I'm, I'm the same way. I'm in a mop and I'll look at it. And I, I describe it as, uh, uh, it's, it's not throwing an interception that, that I get upset about because I don't throw that many interceptions. It's, there was somebody standing wide open in the end zone and I missed them. And no one will necessarily know that or else there was a three pointer that I, that was wide open and I just didn't see it. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I'll like, I'll wake up at four in the morning and I'll think, oh man, there was a great teaching moment right there. They could have been so helpful to people and I missed it. And the, you know, the, I can't get the conversation back. And then, you know, if I can't get back to sleep in 20 minutes, this is the rule, then, uh, then I'll get up. And my solution to that is very simple. I, I create forward. Uh, I, uh, uh, I focus on, on uh, what hasn't happened and, and what I might go into my creative work or preparing for something or whatever. And that's my way of, of dealing with it. Cause I, my ability to kind of go back and, you know, think about the three pointers I didn't take uh, that were wide open or is immense. And, uh, and so I have to have these strategies for no, you know, that's irrelevant at this point. It's like sunk cost. Uh, it, it, and the best thing you can do is to create forward, create forward, create forward, create forward. I actually have a little thing on my wall called the create forward manifesto. It's literally right on my wall that I wrote a number of years ago. And, um, uh, and I, and, and one of the really critical lines in it is, I want to retire from worry, but not from work. Mm. So, um, would you like to talk about long life and oh, but on the on the forgiveness things? Just just tie up something from last time, and I might have mentioned it, but the reason I ask about forgiveness is that one of the hardest things for me, because um, as I you know as we talked about before, my my dad died when I was twenty three, and when I went to Santa Fe and left that time, the, the Albuquerque rather, um, visit where I realized there is no dad here. It's like that scene in, in apocalypse. Now, you know, there ain't no CEO here. Well, there, there's no dad here. And, uh, and I carried a lot of anger and resentment and judgment about that. And, um, and then because my father died, I never had a chance to like reconcile. And what I finally realized is that, you know, forgiveness is something I had to learn how to forgive somebody who's no longer here and to let that go. Right? And, and, the, and that it's the act of forgiveness is something I had to go through, even though my father is no longer here. And that was enormously liberating, right? I do not need to be judging somebody um, and be fueled by that. Uh, I can, and that, I like your idea of the word letting go. It's, letting it's like letting that go i don't need that i can let that disappear i think that's a good point yeah i have no further follow-up on that one yeah. i i think that most people just don't let it go right when they when you bring something up 
later on, a year later, six months later, two years later, you're still thinking about it. You haven't or 10 or 20 or 30. Yeah, you haven't <laughs> let it go. You, you, yeah. You know, and I think that um, people like you and me, and maybe we've been forced to let things go and forced to find a way to do that. So maybe it's easier for us than some other people. But So long life and short life. Um, this is another great lesson from Bill and, um, and in the, uh, uh, in, in, in the, in the book, I wrote it as put the butter on your waffles, but, uh, uh, cause it really captured, there's a crystalline moment. And so, so Bill, uh, Bill had this, Bill, Bill always seemed to find a way to be smiling, which isn't necessarily my, my approach to the world. And, um, I would often take things you know, very seriously and very intensely. And so we were, we were writing the original version of being entrepreneurship, uh, together. And, uh, on that original version, it was the very first book I ever wrote. And I was struggling, uh, to, to write, uh, my, uh, working on the writing part of it. And I would basically get to the end of the day and I'd throw a bunch of pages in the wastebasket. I'm just like, God, I'm totally inadequate at this. And this is so hard. And of course, what you realize, anybody who writes, tries to write well, even if over the course of decades you become a better writer, is it, the, the only reason writing becomes uh, easy to read is because it's hard to write. And writing is just hard. I, I think of writing as, um, uh, as like running. It, it, it never, uh, if you're going to run your best, it's always going to hurt. And so if you can run a five minute mile and then you get it down to 430, well, if you run a 430 and that's your best time, it's going to hurt as bad as when you used to run the five minute mile and it was your best time. You're just faster, but it's going to hurt. And writing is kind of like that. It's like, you know, it never gets easier. You only get better. So I was beginning, but I hadn't yet really accepted the reality of that's what writing is about. And so I'm struggling and I'm throwing things away and I'm just really miserable as opposed to just kind of like, this is just what writing is. And I go to Bill and, uh, and, I, and I sort of whine about my suffering. And, and I expected Bill to give me a lecture on you know, this, this is like, you know, this is the time to really grit through and, you know, it's really going to, uh, it's really going to hurt, but this is just something you have to endure. And, you know, it's kind of like, you got to keep going and, you know, that sort of like, you know, the, the, the hard edge thing. And instead what I got was this, this response where he just said, oh, well, okay, well, if this isn't fun, we should stop doing it. Mm. And I'm like, say what? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? We're writing, we're writing a book. Uh, nowhere in the contract does it say have fun. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? So he says, no, you seriously, he says, like, if this just isn't fun, if we can't find a way to make it fun, we should just not do it. And, and it was just this, it was so perfectly built because he just, he so deeply believed that if you can't find a way to make something fun and enjoyable, then you just, you sort of miss the point because along the way, there just aren't that many days and years in life anyways. And then the day after we turned in the manuscript for the original edition of Beyond Entrepreneurship, uh, Bill had a quintuple bypass surgery. He had a heart attack. And a few months after that, we were having one of our morning our Saturday morning waffle fest. We would go to Peninsula Creamery in Palo Alto and we would meet there at, on Saturday morning and we would have waffles and talk about whatever. And Bill would we'd just talk about whatever. And it was just Bill continuing to invest in shape and care. And uh, he puts butter and syrup on his waffle, like a big piece of butter. And and then it puts the warm syrup on it. It all kind of mixes together. I mean, it's, you know, it's really great, right? But I, I look at it kind of in horror. And I go, Bill, Bill, you got a quintuple bypass. What are you doing? And he just continues to put the butter on his waffles and enjoy his waffle and has a smile. And then he says to me, you know, Jim, uh, when I was being wheeled into the operating room, I think I had a smile on my face because... I realized right at that moment that I'd had a really great life. 
And if this happened to be like the end, and I don't come out of this, um, Dorothy and I have had a great run. And everything from here is going to be gravy on top of that because I really had this sense of this complete sense of common acceptance. Like, if this is it, man, it was a great run. I've had a great life. And he said to know that, to really know that when you're being wheeled in and, the, and you're going to have the quintuple bypass, and that was my feeling. I wasn't afraid. I was just grateful for my life. That's the moment I knew I'd really had a great life. And so I'm putting the butter on my waffles. And what, what Bill um, believed was, well, one, just this notion that time just goes by really, really fast. And it goes faster and faster. Now, someday I'd love to hear on your show a psychologist or somebody who can explain to me why it's the same 24 hours, but they're always faster. And Bill and I, I put this little story in the, in the chapter. I, I, I said to Bill one day, I said, Bill, you know, you notice that time's going by faster? And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, I just noticed that, you know, garbage days, when I have to put the garbage out, seem to be coming quicker and quicker. It's like, oh my goodness, it's garbage day again. I know it's the same seven days, but man, it sure seems like a faster seven days when I was, than when I was young. And he said, ah, well, why do you get to my age? And Christmases start coming around as fast as garbage days. <laughs> and, uh, but, but that notion, he said, you know, time accelerates. And so actually, you know, it, I don't know what the psychology of it is. I have a weird little theory on it. But, but nonetheless, this notion that, you know, that the days seem, to, they're the same 24 hours, but they go by faster. And it's the same month and it goes by faster. And the same year and it goes by faster. Click, 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 click. And he just said, he said, what that really teaches me is it's going to be over in an instant. I don't care if you get 100 years or 110 years or 70 years. It's over in an instant. And um, it is short. And I don't care how many years you get. It is short. And it is gone in the blink of an eye. So given that reality, Bill said, I think in terms of a great life. It's the integral, right? Summation of all the moments of your life, integrated from birth to death, experience TDT. And um, that's what your life adds up to. It's the summation of those moments. And Bill was like, however many you get, it's the quality of them. And that uh, he lived with till the end. And then he um, woke up from a nap uh, December of 2004, and he was walking across the uh, to, to the bathroom, and he fell dead from congestive heart failure. And um, Dorothy said he had a smile on his face. And uh, that was it. And I, I lost Bill, um, and did, as did hundreds of other people. But he had absolutely a great life, and his impact on all those people was so immense. These lives he changed, not just mine, but hundreds and hundreds of other people's lives that he changed, creates that he did more through those people with his life um, than almost anyone I've ever met. And he's still touching people and changing lives. Right, and that's why I, I, I you know, bringing this this. 2.0 version of the book out is to re, is to bring Bill to all these people who didn't get the benefit of Bill like I did. I want to switch gears a little bit here mm -hmm. and talk about decision making, which is something we didn't really dive into last time we spoke, which I was really surprised when I searched our transcript mm -hmm. just lightly for decision making. Mm -hmm. There was no queries. I was like, oh my God, how could I have Jim Collins? on the line for a few hours and not talk about decision making. So. And it's been one of your consistent themes. Totally. Of I, yeah. I think I just get lost in our conversations and, and sort of lose sort of uh, track yeah. of some of the things that I want to ask you. I just wish we had like, mm. I could sit with you for a week, but well, why do so many executives suffer from indecision, but leaders who build great companies don't seem to, how do we prevent analysis paralysis from sort of preventing us from making a decision? 
Hmm. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about executive decision making because we've looked at it uh, quite a bit. So this, this is it's interesting because we were talking earlier at the very start when you and I got together about these sort of buckets of, of, uh, of personal journey story and, and process and content. So this is a good content area. So we know quite a bit about this from our research. And just to review for, for everyone, maybe if you haven't heard the, the previous podcast, um, you know, our, our research method is we study the uh, histor- we do match pair. We find pairs of companies that were in the same spot, same time, same resources, same potential that then uh, had different trajectories. And then we study them in slices of history uh, over time to try to really understand what separated one from another, particularly during the era when one was great and the other was not. And, uh, but the key to that is historical right? Uh, and, uh, and meaning that you try to go back in time. You don't, you don't read just later accounts of why, you know, Intel decided to do the 1103 memory chip. You have to try to go back and sort of see what did the world look like to the people at Intel when they were making that decision, right? So that you can then sort of follow through this iterative, uh, it's like an iterated movie, right? Watching through step by step, okay, let's freeze frame here. Here they are in 1972. Here's the context. Here's the environment. And then you look over at the comparison company and you say, what were they doing? They were looking at the same context, same environment. How did they make the, the decision different, et cetera? And then you you replicate that and you picture it that that if you, if you think about uh, our research and something that Morton Hansen, one of my great colleagues, uh, taught me is the power of breaking things into events. Uh, last time we talked about luck events, right? And, and, that, and, and you could think of it as that what we have is, okay, you could have, say, 11 pairs of companies. Well, you don't actually only have 11 things to look at or 11 pairs to look at. If you then disaggregate them across uh, time, right, and you take their entire history, well, now you can do something. Now you can have hundreds or thousands of decision events, right? So now you've got buckets where you've got much larger numbers to work with. Let's look at all the decision events over time and look at how they turned out, how they made them to the extent that we can see that, how is it different in the comparison company, and you can begin to do things. So that notion of event analysis through a historical match pair method uh, is very much how uh, we come at our work. And, And Morton's ability to be able to say, which we use in Great by Choice a lot, which is how to break things into these discrete events that you can look at, you know, many, many uh, incidents for, for, for doing really good analysis. And one of the things we looked at uh, in our research over time is uh, decisions, uh, big decisions, small decisions, processes of decisions, and so forth. And uh, I guess let me just sort of um, tick through a few things that became clear from the research on this, because it's, it's actually quite interesting on, on, on decisions. Uh, the um, try to be reasonably organized with this. So first, let me um, let me share a story. Uh, it's, it's a I could use a corporate story, but it's actually one that we used in great by choice uh, about Andy Grove and. Um, and, and it was when Andy Grove got his prostate cancer. Okay, so we have all the decision points about how Intel made decisions from its inception and so forth. But this one really was a fascinating kind of lens so you can, we can maybe all relate to the decision as opposed to knowing how all microprocessors work or memory chips work and so on and so forth. So Andy Grove gets this um, uh, prostate cancer diagnosis. And I don't remember all the details of it, but... At the time, as I understand it, uh, there there was a, you know some degree of ambiguity, uh, and maybe still today. I'm not an expert in prostate cancer or prostate cancer treatments, but there were the, all these different things. I mean, there was the implant seeds and surgeries and radiation and all these different things that you could you could do, and uh, and and Andy Grove hit. And so you talk about okay, now you got a decision to make. What am I going to do? Okay, so you got a real decision. I have to decide what I'm going to do about this diagnosis. And you're Andy Grove, right? You're probably one of the best corporate decision makers in history. So um, one approach would be, I'm just going to follow what my doctors say, or I'm going to follow the standard of care. Well, what, what he did was he, he got good advice from different doctors, et cetera, but then he became, like he really analyzed. He became, he's like, he described it like the second PhD 
And, uh, and he really went into really learning and analyzing systematically. So I'm getting to your question about analysis, right? He really analyzed it. This is a, this is a significant life-altering decision. So he's not just going to be like, I just need to decide, you know, and if I make a mistake, I'll self-correct. Well, look, if you do certain kinds of surgery, you can't self-correct. So we want to make a good decision. But if you just sort of wait forever, well, then maybe the cancer will get you, right? So you've got this tension between the two. So he, he does his, um, his, you know, sort of self-directed PhD in this stuff and eventually chooses a course. I forget what the exact course is. It's in Great by Choice. We wrote about it a little bit. But in there is something that really illustrates, because once he made his decision, it was a very clear and unambiguous decision of what he did. Um, I can't remember the exact sentence we used, but it went something like this. What Morton and I observed was that uh, it's not a choice between like analysis and bold, fast decision making. It's about using really good empirical evidence and really good analysis as the basis for clear and decisive decision. And that's what he did. And then notice there's something else, though. There's a really critical aspect of the decision making. And so Morton and I got very, very curious about something, which is we got curious. We were studying companies that went from startup to 10 times better than their industries for the, for the book Great by Choice in the most turbulent industries we could find. So that's why we're looking at semiconductors and you know, software and biotechnology in the early days, et cetera. And one of the questions that we really wanted to understand was speed and pace of decisions. Is there any, um, what did the, what would the evidence say is the correlation between speed of decision-making and quality of outcome? Right. Okay. So we, uh, so we analyzed this and what we found was that um, the, the 10 X leaders had a much wider range of ability between slow, medium, and fast. And sometimes they made really big decisions quickly. And sometimes they made really big decisions slowly. And there wasn't really seemed to be a pattern. And I was sort of trying to figure this out. And so, um, uh, and often the comparison companies would often act very quickly, the sense of like, we got to do something. We got to move. We've got right. And, and so, what Morton and I observed was this, is that the first question in decision-making is how much time before our risks change? And that, uh, and, and so let's go back to the cancer case. So where Andy Grove's cancer situation as he understood it going to change in a matter of days. His risk profile was going to be the same a week or even six months later. He had, he had, he didn't have years, but he had months. And so he used the time he had before his risks would likely change to be able to make a better decision. And that, um, and, but then if you have a situation, if you have a, I mean, I'll remember when the fires broke out here in 2009 and we got a call from a friend of ours who was in the mountains. It's just like, we got to get out of here now. It's coming over the hill. Okay. So there are some situations where it's literally minutes or maybe days and the risks are going to change. Right. Or it could be something where it's, um, it could be years, Right. And, and, and your risks aren't going to change you, the risk of missing an opportunity or the risk of, of getting it wrong. My friend, Georgia Paula Lehman, who grew up in Latin America and, and, and was very successful in the tumult of, of Latin America, said something to me. He said, you know, people have such a need to resolve ambiguity and uncertainty that they often act quicker than they need to because it's dealing with their own need to make the uncertainty go away. And what we learned in building companies in Latin America is the uncertainty never goes away. So often we learn to like, if we can let events unfold without our risk changing, we will let them unfold. But when we need to act, we will act. And so I, what I found is, the, or what, what really Morton uh, and I found in our research is the question is not fast decision or slow decision, you know, as sort of proxies for decisive or not. It's how much time before your risk changes 
and then make your decision within that time frame. So that's one big thing uh, that, that we learned. Another big thing we learned is, near as I can tell, there is no correlation between consensus decisions and intelligent decisions. Uh, in the history of corporate history, most great decisions are taken where there's still substantial disagreement still in the air. And, um, uh, and they are taken with, um, without a need for uh, consensus. Uh, uh, the, the culture is one of, of disagreement, dialogue, debate, argument, uh, pounding on tables, whatever, leading to a point of clarity, then in a corporate setting, followed by executive decision, followed by unified commitment behind it. That's the pattern that tends to more correlate with our better results. I like that. There's a couple of different directions I want to go there. Yeah, with, sure. With consensus, I think it's really interesting. Groups search for consensus, especially if you have group decision making instead of individuals. Individuals search for truth, whereas group wants cons- uh, groups tend to want to go towards consensus. That way, everybody can tell their own story within the group. If the decision is successful, you go back to your tribe in the organization and you. Uh, you can say that it was because of you, you influenced the group. And if the decision is unsuccessful, you can go back to your tribe. And the story mm. you can tell is that you tried to to persuade them not to do it. And nobody's really accountable for those decisions. Whereas if you have your name on it, you're searching for truth. You're searching for the best decision possible. Yeah, uh, I think that's really interesting, actually. And I, I think that also one of the... Um, uh, key things, I, I think we wrote about this in Good to Great when we were talking about dealing with the brutal facts, uh, but there's this thing that uh, we call autopsies without blame, mm. right? And not all decisions have good outcomes. You know, so, you know, that we, I think we touched last time on this idea of just because you got an adverse outcome and you, you know, when you're in your uh, poker interview, for example, just because you get an adverse outcome doesn't mean you made the wrong decision. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, we, we, we don't want well, a result, right? We don't want to just look at the result of the decision exactly. and determine exactly. if it was a good decision. Exactly. You know, and in, and in investing, of course, you know, that's one of the big lessons is that, you know, you cannot judge the quality of your decision based on the result entirely, right? You, you have to know that there is a stochastic probability that, okay, I think there's a four-fifth chance that this investment will do well. There's a one-fifth chance it might not. Uh, I'm making the decision for the right reasons. I'm making the decision with the right analysis. Um, I'm placing the bet. It still might go against us, but that doesn't mean I made the wrong decision, yeah. <laughs> right? And uh, and so when you have autopsies without blame, the, the, what we found in our comparison companies, and I'm going back to your question about then why does indecision happen? The indecision often happens because you begin to create a culture. This is what we see in our comparison companies where when you get adverse outcomes or things don't go as well as you'd like, or the decision turned out to be, well, boy, if we'd known X, Y, and Z, we would have done something different. Then instead of an autopsy without blame to understand, to gain understanding, to assume that uh, people did their best and so forth, but let's really understand what actually happened so we can make better decisions in the future or refine our process, you search for somebody to blame. And the moment that you introduce autopsies with blame, Mm. as opposed to autopsies without blame, the more you are going to begin to create an environment where it's like, man, the upside downside here of making a decision is, you know, you've got upside downside for the company. It's an agency problem, right? If everybody becomes indecisive, that's bad for the company, but it might be very good for their careers. It's really interesting. As you were saying that, I was sort of thinking about in relationships, your personal relationships, the minute you start scorekeeping versus having conversations, mm-hmm. you've, started, you, you've started this negative spiral, right? The doom loop, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, um, yeah, the decision making has been uh, very uh, interesting to study over time. And I think that if people are waiting for agreement or consensus, that is one of the things that uh, uh, we found does not correlate with the best decisions. So how do we build this uncertainty muscle? Like how do we develop our ability to live with ambiguity? What are, what are the patterns to that? Like how do we go about doing that? Hmm. So, 
it's interesting. Let's talk about the entrepreneurial mindset for a moment on this because um, I, uh, I, I used to really puzzle on something, which is if you're risk averse, why would you take a job? And, and, and I used to challenge my students at Stanford on this. It's like, so I remember a student came to me once and said, you know, I, I hear what you say in your class and you really are challenging us to go do something on our own and to create our own companies. And, you know, I understand that just because I, uh, I, I, uh, I want to be in business doesn't mean I have to work for Exxon or IBM or, you know, a hedge fund that's successful or whatever. I, I could carve my own path and uh, really, you know, do it my own way. But, you know, I, I just don't have the risk profile for, um, for doing, doing something entrepreneurial. And, and I would say back to my student, I remember a student came to my office, the exact conversation. It happened multiple times, but I have one specifically in mind. And I think the student was looking at like a job from Exxon or something. And I said, um, well, what's one of the first things you learn in investing? Uh, now, obviously, the facetious view is the most successful investment strategy is a highly undiversified wor- portfolio where you are right. Um, the problem is that last part, right? <laughs> you may not be right. So one of the first things you learn is, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket, right? Diversification. So let me ask you a question, because that's high risk, right? What's a job? It's all your eggs in one basket. You basically have made a highly undiversified portfolio bet. Oh, and by the way, you have very little control over it. You, you, you don't get, you, you're exposed to, if it turns out that the people running the company are idiots or they make really bad decisions, you've made a bad bet that other people are making bad decisions that are affecting your bet. And you just threw your whole, you're like, it's a one zero. You have a job. And the political environment within organizations is, so in an entrepreneurial world, there's risks, but maybe they're more uh, clear, right? What your risks are. There's this market risk of finance risk. Of capital. Inside organizations, there's this thing called political risks. Now, those of us who are not good at that, and I am one of these people who's not good at that, you can get blindsided because you just don't understand how the politics work. So now you got that risk in there. And as Irv Grosbeck, one of my other mentors who I admire greatly, always used to say, yes, there are risks to entrepreneuring, but never forget, there are equal risks, maybe even higher risks to not entrepreneuring. And so um, why would you, so if you really want to be risk averse, why would you throw all your eggs in one basket that you don't even control and has all this political risk within it? Why would you take a job? And, um, and, and so I would have this conversation with a number of my students. Finally, it began to dawn on me. Because think about it. See, if you take an entrepreneurial path, okay, a product A is not working, product B is not working, I can do C, I can do D. As long as I stay alive, I can t- keep, you know, doing hands at the table until something does get working, then I can get the flywheel going. I can build a portfolio of clients, right? I've got diversification. I've got different revenue streams. I can do all this kind of stuff, and I can do more to control it. That strikes me as lower risk. And oh, and by the way, what if you wake up at age 55 and the company that you threw your whole life in turns out to all of a sudden be going through one of these huge downsizings and at age 55, you're out. That strikes me as horrifyingly risky. And then it began to dawn on me. They're actually taking increased risk in order to reduce ambiguity. If you have a job, you kind of know what you're doing, right? It's much less ambiguous. It's much less, it's the paint by numbers a kit approach to life. And I follow the paint by numbers a kit as opposed to I go out on my own. It's a blank canvas. It's a lot more ambiguous. What do I, where do I start? What colors do I use? What kind of painting do I want to make? Right. And what I realized is that people, my students anyways, would take increased risk in order to reduce ambiguity. So I think people are very ambiguity averse. And, uh, and that's part of why they don't do an entrepreneurial path. And I used to come into my classroom and I would put up a little equation. And I would say, what are the probabilities of being successful as an entrepreneur? 
And uh, let's suppose that it's kind of a multiplicative probability thing. And one probability is, so the end result is probability of success as an entrepreneur. And, um, but then you can break that into two parts that lead to that probability. The first part of that is probability that you will find a way to be successful if you start times probability that you will actually start. And then I would turn to my students and I would say, tell me about the risks on these. Well, most of those students would look at it and say, if I really threw my whole life into it, probabilities that I will be successful if I start and I do it in a really smart way are actually not that low. Uh, I could find a way, especially if I can be persistent long enough to iterate to find a result that will work. So let's turn to the other one. Probabilities that you will start. Well, as you go, let two years go by, five years go by, then you have houses and commitments and all these things. And at some point, as more and more of the sort of accoutrements of life build up, the probabilities that you will start go down. Mm-hmm. Because now you have loss aversion. A huge loss aversion. And when you're young, you have nothing to lose. You know, Joanne and I took our Thelma and Louise leap and went out on our own. Well, I mean, yeah, it was really scary, but it it didn't have a whole lot to lose, even though there wasn't much of a safety net. And, uh, but the further along you get, that probability goes down. It's a rare person who decides at 55 to say, I'm launch in the entrepreneurial path. Some do. We talked about George Rathman last time. There are some that do. So what that really means is the real swing variable in being an entrepreneur is the probability that you will start, not the probability that you will succeed if you start. I want to come back to something you said about ambiguity of version. Mm -hmm. That makes me think of one of the reasons that we have all these procedures and organizations is because we want to avoid ambiguity if we follow the procedure we're always Mm -hmm. right we don't have to exercise a ton of judgment even if the outcome is wrong we did what we were supposed to do we can't get in trouble what do you think of that so i think this is a really really great question and 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 forgive me for taking a moment to to pause um and think and 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 as i process through all of our research on this question Here's what I, and I need more time to, to validate it all, but based upon the research, here's what I, 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 would, I would say. Um, it's a genius of the and, how the best end up dealing with this, and kind of a tyranny of the or of, the, uh, of those who don't do it well. So let's talk about kind of the, the positive model on this. So we know that uh, as our companies the leaders who built them became enormously successful. Um, they were really good at, uh, at certain kinds of replicable recipes and, uh, and, and, and really, really good at those. So if you take, for example, you know, Southwest Airlines, which amazingly became the best performing stock over a 30-year period from 1972 to 2002, startup company, three airplanes, uh, and then you know, expanded that across the country. And if you, if you study it very carefully... Uh, what you'll find is something that, and this is really a surprise to a lot of people, but again, this is the power of historical analysis. This is the power of evidence-based research where you're always doing, you know, constant comparative analysis. So if we look at, so so let me actually, let's just take this case because it really is going to teach something about all this. So on the one hand, um, in order to really build and make a flywheel go really far, you need to have some replicable recipes that you're going to be staying with more or less for quite some time. So you go back to the early days of Southwest Airlines, and they originally copied their recipe from Pacific Southwest Airlines. It's actually an amazing startup story because you're, you're back in the late 1960s, early 1970s, and uh, their original business plan was copy PSA in Texas. PSA was Pacific Southwest Airlines. They were based in California. People who from that era may remember the, the, air, the company that had the planes that were the sort of point-to-point commuter planes that had little smiley faces on the bottom, you know, on the front part of the, uh, of the fuselage and made it look like a smiley face in the sky. That was PSA. And Southwest Airlines uh, basically flew out there and 
and, and uh, basically copied their model and took it back to Texas. And this was pre-deregulation, so PSA you know, gladly shared with them how they do things, so much so that, in fact, if you ever wondered why, why Southwest Airlines is called Southwest Airlines based in Texas, well, you know, if, you, if you basically have the entire recipe and all you do is cross out the word Pacific, you get Southwest Airlines. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's, it's like a photocopy of the original idea. Mm-hmm. But, but, but here was the difference. Southwest Airlines really understood why it worked. And at PSA, so now let's actually just, this is, stay with me for a moment. Let's just use this as a great case to illustrate on your point. There's going to be two parts to this. But the first is, so PSA, after a certain point, the recipe kind of became roped. Nobody could explain to you, well, why do we do fun things in the cabin? Why do we, you know, uh, keep a certain kind of aircraft? You know, why do we try to turn the planes fairly quickly, right? At some point, this sort of real understanding of why this recipe, why do we put raisins in the oatmeal cookies? You know, why, 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 right? It gets turned into mindless procedure. Mm-hmm. And if you were to quiz, you would say, why, does, why do we do that? You wouldn't get a good answer. It's what we do. At Southwest Airlines, Herb Kelleher and uh, Roland King and those folks, they really emphasize and train their people, this is why we do the recipe, okay? Why do we fly only 737s? Well, let's go through like 10 reasons why we only fly 737s. One set of parts. Every pilot can fly every aircraft in our system. One set of training manuals, one set of flight simulators, one set, right? They're the entire standardized system, and then they're perfect for point to point, and they're a really reliable aircraft. And da, 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 that's why we're going to bet on the 737, and we're going to replicate that. Why do we not do first class seats? Why do we, everything you could go through, and they could say, there are reasons why we have this recipe. This is why we have the oatmeal, uh, why we have raisins in this oatmeal. Why do we turn the planes really fast? Not because like 10 minute turn is cool or 20 minute turn is cool, it's because our economic engine is based upon having the planes in the air. And the longer they're at the gates, the more they're not earning money. The more they're in the air, the more they're earning money. Turn the planes, turn the planes, turn the planes. What's the recipe for a plane coming in, getting it turned, get it back out again, right? We bake the cookies and we know how to bake the cookies. And then when we expand out across the country, there's this, you know, they're baking the cookies. Now we're baking the cookies in Kansas. We're baking the cookies to Las Vegas. We're baking the cookies out to Kansas City. And we're baking the cookies out to, right? And, and they've got this recipe. And we did this interesting analysis, Morton and I, where we asked ourselves a simple question. In turbulent environments, uh, it, it, it's not that the really successful companies had a, had a recipe and the other company didn't. It was something else because both companies had a recipe. And we found this over and over again in our pairs. The difference was this. The folks at... Southwest understood the reasons and rationale behind the recipe so that if there ever came a time when that rationale was no longer supported, you could change a piece of the recipe based upon that rationale. If, for example, you say, Luke, we only do short haul. Well, why do we only short haul? Because 737s have a two-hour range, and there's a lot of reasons why we do 737s. Well, what if something changes where 737s now have a three-hour range or a four-hour range? Oh, well, then that rationale doesn't apply. We could do a four-hour range, right? So see, the understanding of the recipe. Now, we did an interesting analysis where we basically said, okay, if every successful company has a recipe of some things they do over and over again, things they replicate, 20-minute turns, whatever it is, how much do those recipes change over time? You've got the really successful companies, and you've got the co- comparisons that didn't do as well in the same period. And you can actually calculate this because you go back and do your historical analysis and so on and so forth. Here's the interesting thing. One set of companies changes the recipe about 80% over, say, 30 years. And the other changes the recipe about 20% over, say, 30 years. Now, here's the pop quiz question. Which group is the more successful companies? the 80% change or the 20% change? And the answer is the 20% change, which surprised us. We thought that what you would find is that the companies that are the most successful are going to change the most in a changing world. That's not what we found. What we found is they don't 
have it as change or not change. A change, the world's changing, we have to change. We have to change fast and we have to pivot and we have to, right? No. Very deliberate thing. We understand a recipe. And then the question always is, what's, the, what's in the right 20% to change and why? So take a great investor like Warren Buffett. He doesn't do the same thing he did when he first started doing cigar butts. But there's a lot of elements of the recipe that are the same. But then every once in a while, you can make a single change that's pretty significant. No longer cigar butts, but now let's invest. Instead of buying cheap companies, you know, cigar butt companies at super cheap prices, let's buy great companies at good prices and hold them for a really long time. It's still value investing, right? And a lot of elements of that, but that's in the 20% to change. And so what you find is that that ability where people get in trouble is when you have everybody, everybody knows the recipe, but they can't explain to you the rationale behind the recipe. And then that begins to correlate with their decline. And then when they get in trouble because they don't understand the rationale, they panic. And Pacific Southwest Airlines panicked in the wake of deregulation and fuel shocks and began making wholesale changes to its recipe. Let's throw out the raisins. Well, why? Do we need to do that? And then they started in a doom loop downwards. Now, that's a long story on that side, but there's one other piece. This is the genius of the end part. One of my favorite things that came from uh, Built to Last was in chapter six. And it was about the development of Nordstrom over its greatest years. And we put, we put a replica of Nordstrom's uh, employee manual in chapter six of Built to Last. Jerry Portis and I, we did this. And basically what it said was, uh, welcome to Nordstrom. You're part of a customer service machine and so forth. But then it said, um, Nordstrom rules. Rule number one. Use your best judgment in all situations. There will be no additional rules. Okay, so now how do we put these two together? We were talking earlier about trust. So what we really found makes a great flywheel, a great company go is you've got an incredible, replicable, scalable recipe. It's an overall corporate approach to the world and you really know how that works. And you really understand why it works. And you can, and people can explain why it works. And you multiply your success by baking the cookies with 20% evolution, like amending a constitution over time. But on the other hand, you have people, first two, right? The right people who you trust who you can say in the context of our system, which we all understand how it works because you're the kind of person we'd like to understand it, you can say to them, to the person on the aircraft, if you have an unruly passenger, use your best judgment in all situations. We trust you. And so when you put the right people who you trust, who were selected for their values and their judgment, next to a highly replicable disciplined recipe and you put the two of those together, now you have the genius of and that better explains a Southwest Airlines relative to a PSA over time, a big part of the answer, not the only answer, but a big part. Does that help at all? That's super helpful. For every Warren Buffett out there, there, there's, you know, a thousand people who talk like him, walk like him, and basically try to copy him. How do you distinguish the people who are copying and don't understand why the recipe works from the people who copy? And, and you know, on the surface, it's really hard to ascertain that. What are, what are the ways that we can go about separating the people that know from the people that don't? Um, can I just get a clarifying aspect of that of that question change? So in terms of like if you were evaluating an executive team or evaluating a company, evaluating or for yourself, I, I mean, there's just kind of a lot of different ways it could come out this question. Totally. So I, I think we can apply it to people because I feel like that might be easier than mm -hmm. to companies, but it, it would apply to companies too, right? There, there's these sort of people who mimic and copy and the, there's people who are the real McCoy. And how do you separate the different, like, 
how do you determine the difference between the two as a casual observer? What are the ways, the signals, the who really understands it? Because it, it, in good times, they're probably both getting really good results. Mm -hmm. But in bad times, you're going to get massively different outcomes, as we saw with your your examples here. So, um, so I'm thinking through now uh, the kind of data set in my head of the utterly uh, extraordinary people that um, that I've either studied or had the privilege to know and observe up close. In some cases, they're both. And, um, and, and I, uh, it, it's interesting because you know, one of the, um, one of the things that George Paulo Lehman, who's a dear friend of mine, uh, said to me once, he said, you know, I think of myself as a teacher ultimately. I found that a very interesting statement. Mm. And, and actually I think though, when I think about the great folks who really are the real McCoy is they so deeply understand what it is that they're doing, that they are great teachers of it. What is Buffett's annual reports? They are seminars, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and let, let me, let me share somebody who I really think of as a great hero. And I, I uh, just is a wonderful man, uh, on so many dimensions, but I think really illustrates this. And let's take Jack Bogle. So, um, actually, can we just can I just share with you a little Jack Bogle story? Of course. So, uh, about three years ago, uh, uh, well, of course, as you know from the flywheel monograph, I've been close to Vanguard for, for some time and helped them get their flywheel right, or they got their flywheel right by me just asking them to get it right, I guess is really what happened. But uh, uh, but I, I got to know Vanguard well and how they built this incredible flywheel that 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 that's just almost perfect, right? You know, you start with we offer lower cost mutual funds, and if we do that, you can't you can't help but deliver superior returns for the same you know, asset. Uh, and if we do that, we can't help but uh, have really, you know, satisfied clients because we've done that. And if we do that, we can't help but grow assets under management. If we do that, we can't help but increase economies of scale. And if we do that, we can't help but be able to lower costs on mutual funds again. And around and around this, this beautiful flywheel goes. And it's been going for, for, for you know, now into trillions of dollars since uh, when Jack Bogle founded it. And I've always admired the purity of it. And, uh, and I've always admired Jack Bogle as a result. So I was at this thing in New York and, uh, we were, we were both being, uh, inducted into something. And I noticed Bogle was there. I was like, wow, Jack Bogle's there. So I, I go up to him and he was kind of on his cane and, you know, he had a heart transplant many years ago. And I said, Hey, I don't mean to intrude on your space. I just want you to know how much I admire you and what you built at Vanguard. And he, he looks up and he says this warm smile and he says, uh, Oh, uh, Jim. Yes, um, uh, you know I, I've read your books, and we should talk sometime. Do you ever get to Philadelphia? And I thought uh, I can get to Philadelphia. <laughs> so, so uh, he said, you know, after this, why don't you reach back out to me? We should talk. Mm -hmm. So now at this point, he's like eighty-seven or eighty-eight, right? And he's Jack Bogle. And so I get home and I tell Joanne about, God, I met Jack Bogle and, you know, he invited me out to come out to Malvern and, and have a conversation. And, and then I started thinking and I started hesitating because I kept thinking, you know, I don't, I mean, how many Jack Bogle days are left? I don't want to steal one. So I hummed and hawed and hesitated. And finally, Joanne said to me, she said, you know, make it easy for him to say no. But reach back out to him. He asked you to. So I sent him this email. I said, Dear Mr. Bogle, uh, we, you know, we met in New York, et cetera. And then I just sort of went through this long description of giving him all these. I know you're busy. You're probably working on your next book and wouldn't really fit in. But I just wanted to say I was nice to meet you, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, sent the email off, giving him every opportunity to say he's too busy, right? Or it wasn't going to work. I get this email back. Dear Jim, first, it's Jack, not Mr. Bogle. Uh, I'm so glad you followed up. I so much wanted to have a conversation with you and I wanted to, to follow up with you, but I didn't want to seem pushy. Please come to Melbourne. So I get on a plane and I go out there and I, I go and 
we ended up having almost an entire day together. And, and, and first of all, just as kind of an image for life, um, my, my new research that's going to follow now that I'm kind of done with the what makes great companies tick research after 30 years and so forth, I'm turning to the question of why do some people remain incredibly renewed over the entire long arc of a life so well, and maybe others not as well. So I meet Bogle, he's 88, and, and we sit there, I mean, a, a real meeting, a real conversation. And you got a picture, like he had done his Princeton thesis on, I think, mutual funds, essentially, in the early days of that, decades and decades earlier, right? What was it, six decades earlier? And he's still incredibly engaged and passionate and energized about this. When you look into Jack Bogle's eyes, they are burning with an 18-year-old's intensity, just coming right out of his eyes and into the room. We just have this, it's like, I, you, you would have no thought, I'm talking to somebody who's 88, who had a heart mm-hmm. transplant. And, and, uh, and then, of course, the, the, the sort of slight coda to that was when we went to get lunch and we went and had peanut butter and jelly sandwiches together over in the, what they call the galley, which is great. It took us 20 minutes to walk across the courtyard because his body was failing. But the renewed, engaged mind, oh, it's still there. And in that day, now notice what Bogle did. Bogle had their incredible recipes that make uh, Vanguard go, the mutual structure, right? The, the cost on the mutual funds, the highly diversified, the low tax efficient, you know, high tax efficiency because you don't trade that much, the way indexing is done, all these things, right, that are part of serving their clients and, and the flywheel. It's a different model. I'm not saying it's a, you know, there are multiple types of investing models that can work, but that's theirs, right? And it, it's, it's a recipe. But when you sit down and you follow Bogle, what did he do? He became a great teacher of it. His books are lessons. His conversations, they're not sales, they're teachings. When he tries to help you understand why uh, high expense ratios are a wealth tax, he helps you deeply understand their recipes and why. And then he is a teacher of the pieces. And what I have found is that, uh, and in his life, he was still teaching right up until his breath ran out. And what I have found is that, you know, the, whether you're talking about, you know, any of these people, when Herb Kelleher would talk about what it is that makes Southwest go, the emotion around his people, and he would cry over that. And his incredible understanding, well, why, why don't we introduce meals? And then he would just go through this reason. Let me explain this to you. Help me teach you this. Let me share this with you. Let me share with you mistakes we made in the past and what that teaches. He was a teacher. And when you find someone who is able to teach versus giving you rote lessons, I think that's how you, one indicator of the real difference. I love that. I think that's such a great answer because it shows the depth and the nuance and the sophistication and, and, and the simplicity that sort of comes in mm-hmm. on the other side of it, but it dives into why. Yeah. Yeah. And if you can't teach it well, you don't understand it. I want to switch gears here. I'm cognizant of your time. And there's one thing I want to make sure we get to you before we, we sort of. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I I, uh, I was, I just want to share, I was quite worried we wouldn't have enough to talk about. And it looks like we're not going to have that problem. Oh, gosh, Jim. There's, I, could, I could keep going for days here. Um, you said you're at the midpoint in your career and you've spent some time consolidating it onto a map. Mm-hmm. And I think we've yeah. covered. Uh, you know, a large part of that map on the last list. But one thing we didn't, or last time we were on the podcast, but last one thing we didn't hit on was the Stockdale paradox. Yes. And I think that's critically important um, to think about right now. What is it and why is it important? So, um, so first of all, I, I want to uh, harken back to the session you and I did uh, a, a year ago and, and something, I mean, I, I, I when we were communicating about doing this time, which is, you know, stimulated by Beyond Entrepreneurship 2.0, or I guess we just call it BE 2.0, um, I, I, you know, was 
thinking back to that session, and I was stunned by how much we, uh, you know, you extracted out of the framework. What I really realized is, if you read that transcript, it really lays out a big chunk of that map. I mean, essentially, I guess I was already writing it at the time, which is probably was heavy on my mind. But I think that's the first time in that sort of setting that I've really sort of unfolded the map. And you were very kind to let me sort of unfold it, uh, you know, in its essence. So for anybody who is uh, the, the map is now fully in a chapter in BE 2.0 and so forth. But anybody who wants to sort of hear the verbal version of the unfolding of the map, that previous episode, like you pulled that out of me really well. And, um, uh, but there were certain parts of it we went much more in depth on, such as uh, the flywheel. And I've, I've learned some things about the flywheel since, um, including one idea we might want to touch upon. Uh, we talked about, uh, you know, level five leadership and we talked about who and we, we talked about a number of them. But, uh, and we did talk about brutal facts. Uh, but what we didn't talk about uh, was what I think is the ultimate sort of deepest concept. Uh, around brutal facts. It sort of goes hand in hand with confronted brutal facts. And it's the Stockdale paradox. We're in a Stockdale time. I think we're always in a Stockdale time somewhere in our lives, but this is like a global Stockdale time. And yet the idea is so timeless that even if somebody's listening to this post-COVID, uh, this is an idea to take away for life. So how would you like to, to address it? Would you like me to share the Stockdale story and how the concept came to be? Yes, definitely. I think it's a powerful story. Yeah. So um, Admiral Jim Stockdale, he, he was the highest ranking naval uh, officer in the Hanoi Hilton prisoner of war camp um, in North Vietnam. He was uh, shot down in the late 1960s and he spent uh, seven years in the camp and he had leadership responsibility as that officer uh, in the camp. And I had the tremendous privilege uh, to get to know Admiral Stockdale a bit when he was studying uh, Stoic philosophy across the street at the Hoover Institute, and I was teaching my entrepreneurship and small business class across the street at the Stanford Business School. And uh, I, through a, uh, a student who had actually written a paper on Stockdale, kind of led to me having this chance to have this really life-changing conversation with Admiral Stockdale. We were going to go for a walk on the Stanford campus and have lunch together and talk about whatever. And in preparation for that, I, I read his book, uh, In Love and War, which is alternating chapters uh, written by himself and his wife about his years in the camp. And I'd like you to picture me reading this book. And uh, sitting there in a kind of a really nice, comfortable setting, you know, the Stanford office, and I could look out over the Oval, and it's really pleasant, and it's about as far away from the Hanoi Hilton prison camp as you could get. And I, I found myself, as I began to read the book, felt like this sort of cold, penetrating mist was coming in, and I began to feel this encroaching sense of just despair. And and because what, what it wasn't just the, 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 the horror of what he lived through, right? I mean, you, it could take you out and torture you at any time, and, and they would do that. It put you in leg irons. They would do that, right? But what struck me as so unbelievably oppressive was the idea that when you're going through it, you have no idea how long this is going to be or even if it will ever end. And it's, it's, it's like we can all endure something if we know the end point. I can just, you know, it's, it's only a 26-mile marathon. Right, I'm there's mile no ambiguity. Point. Yeah, there's no ambiguity about end point or weather even, right? But imagine you're at mile 20 of a marathon and you're really suffering, but you have no idea if it's a 100-mile race, a 300-mile race, or a 25-mile race, right? You have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea. This may be the last thing you ever do in your life, and this is what your life's going to feel like till the end, right? You just don't know. And that's what struck me as just the it's just sheer overwhelming ambiguity of the suffering, of how of the extent of the suffering, how long it would be. So, and then it dawned on me, this this sort of flash of realization hit me. Oh my goodness, I'm feeling this. And I'm only reading about it. And I know the end of the story. I know that we're going to see each other the following week. 
We're going to go for a walk on this beautiful campus. We're going to have lunch at the faculty club. And, and I thought, my goodness, if I'm feeling this, not living it, and knowing how it turned out, how on earth did he, and I'm feeling despair, mm. how did he not completely capitulate to despair living it and not knowing whether or when it would ever end? And when I asked him that, he said, oh, I, I never capitulated to despair because I never wavered in my faith that not only that I would get out, but I would turn that into the defining event of my life, that in retrospect, I would not trade. I remember exactly where we were standing when he said that. And we walked all the way over the next, you know, while towards across campus. And we didn't talk at all. I mean, it was interesting. Somebody like Admiral Stockdale feels no need to fill the air with conversation. And finally, as we were getting close to where we were going to have lunch, I said, Admiral Stockdale, I'm curious, who didn't do as well as you? Who didn't make it out as strong as you? And he said, oh, it's easy. It was the optimists. I said, I'm confused. I mean, you sounded optimistic back there. He said, no, I was not optimistic. Let me explain to you what I mean by optimistic. What I mean, the optimists are the ones who said, we're going to be out by Christmas. Mm. And Christmas would come and it would go, and then we're going to be out by Thanksgiving, and it would come and it would go, and another Christmas would come and it would go. And they suffered from a broken heart. And this is, this, this, when I learned this lesson from Admiral Stockdale of this duality, I must never confuse the need on the one hand for absolute unwavering faith that you can and you will prevail in the end. With the need on the other hand for the discipline to confront the most brutal facts as they actually are right now, we're not out of here by Christmas. We came to call that the Stockdale Paradox. And the way it popped out as I was doing the research for Good to Great. And in our last podcast, we talked about Kroger and A&P, right? And we talked about how one of the big differences was that the folks at Kroger confronted the brutal fact of how their world was changing and did superstores, big 20%, you know, in their 20% change. And A&P saw the same brutal facts and denied them. And there, that, that was a big difference. But the bigger idea really came out in the Stockdale Paradox. And I, we were observing this pattern in the research. And one day I just shared that story with the research team. And I said, I just keep thinking about this conversation I had with Admiral Stockdale. And then essentially what happened is that triggered right there in the disciplined thought. So you discipline people, but then in the disciplined thought part of the framework, all of our leaders who led their companies through these often very desperate times, they actually had both sides of that Stockdale paradox. They had this unwavering faith that they would find a way to get to the other side and the discipline to confront the brutal facts as they actually are. We called it the Stockdale paradox and it became part of the framework. It is not a business idea, though. I, I don't know about you, Shane, but this has been a Stockdale year. Totally. Uh, I mean, you know, it's just, and I have friends who are just like, man, I am so done with this. And it's like, yeah. man, we're not out by Christmas. Yeah, same thing. I mean, I had friends in March and April who would be like, oh, this will just go for a couple of weeks. I was like, man, I think we're going to be here for a while. Like, you just don't don't start focusing on a date. Just start focusing on what you control. And Yeah. Yeah. But we will get out of this, which is a good thing. I want to come back to something you said, which is you've, you've learned a lot about um, the flywheel since we talked last. What have you learned? Yeah. yeah so, um, so last time you were, you were, very kind to let me you know, share that we're bringing out the flywheel monograph and sharing it with people and going back to the Amazon story and so forth. And since then, uh, as always with the ideas that come from our research, what I find is that even once I publish something, I get a few months or years or maybe even decades down the road and 
I understand it more than when I wrote it. Uh, it's not that the idea is no longer right. It's that my understanding was previously primitive. And, um, and so one of the things, I don't think we talked about this last time, but this has really become clear to me about a great flywheel. So we talked last time about the idea that you have to have this inexorable logic. We talked a few minutes ago about Vanguard, right? And you get this sense of like, if, you know, if you have lower cost mutual funds, then you can't help but deliver superior returns for the same asset, da, 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 right? And the flywheel drives because of the inexorable logic of momentum of A drives B, B drives C around. And that was the Amazon story, it was the Vanguard story, it was the Eurosport design story and so forth. But then as I began to teach right? The flywheel, so back to the teaching theme of like, you begin to understand things when you can really teach them and share them. I began to realize that uh, a few things started to become uh, very clear about getting your flywheel right, really getting it right. Like where it's, again, it's not, it's not about drawing a circle, uh, you know, taking a list of action steps and drawing it as a circle. That's like that rote version of, well, we have a flywheel, we don't understand it. It's about understanding the true logic of momentum, deep, deep understanding. So um, one thing I've learned is that there's tremendous power in thinking very hard about what is the the 12 o'clock point on the flywheel because it has tremendous signaling. So is your opening point about, you know, creating something like creating the next great bicycle helmets or the next great generation of chips or biotech drugs or whatever, or is it about... Does it start with getting a certain kind of medical professional like at Cleveland Clinic? Does it start with lowering costs as, as Vanguard's was? Like, where's the flywheel start? Even though it's a repeating loop, is there something very powerful about asking that? So that's one thing I've learned. But the second thing I've learned is that there's a, uh, and this I think really gets to how people ought to be thinking about today in the entrepreneurial world, building great flywheels and great companies. There's sort of a right side and a left side of the flywheel. So when you look at a, a flywheel, it's going around the, the clock. I like to think of it as that there's sort of a 12 o'clock to a 6 o'clock part of the flywheel. And then there's a 6 o'clock to the 12 o'clock part of the flywheel. And if you really study the best flywheels, uh, they have a different role. And so on the, on the right-hand side of the flywheel, the 12 o'clock to 6 is really about what you do in the world, what you do to contribute, what you do that makes people's lives better, what you do that is kind of your net ad, right, in some way. And whether it be delivering great health outcomes, whether it be, you know, the next powerful generation of chips that multiply Moore's law over time, whether it's a a biotech drug that's going to be able to solve anemia, whatever the thing is that you lower, you know, better returns for your investors, right? You're doing something in the world. And then as you come up the other side of the flywheel, what you find is that it's about generating fuel, It's how you convert the 12 to 6. The 6 to 12 takes that and converts it into fuel. So let's go back to that Vanguard one we were talking about earlier. You get to the, you know, you're generating returns, you grow assets under management, but then that allows you to get economies of scale. Assets under management and economies of scale become fuel to pop down the other side of the flywheel again. If you get the right medical professionals that then deliver really great health outcomes, uh, for your patients, and then you begin to attract folks from around the world, and then that generates you know services that you uh, get cash flow, which then you can invest as fuel back into the flywheel again. And so, if you really get your flywheel right, you're, you're it's like a two piston machine. Piston one is what are you doing that's useful? What are you doing that makes a difference? What are you doing that's contributing to your customers? What are you doing that's you know making the health outcomes better? It's like it's your ad in the world. And the other is fuel capture, fuel generation, fuel capture to go back into the top of the flywheel and then spin it around again. And one of the things that I think is deeply existential in when you think about all this stuff is when you do the fuel part, what's that about? So first of all, there's just the logic of fuel then just then accelerates the flywheel around again, right? So how do you get the fuel out? But you have to think of it as fuel. And one of the great battles that we continue to have is the basic battle between are you ultimately built to last or built to flip? 
and uh, and that you have one, you know, it's like it's going to be with us forever, right? But it's a basic battle. If you see that the point of the flywheel is to generate resources that get siphoned out of the flywheel, they're really the purpose is to have that flywheel generate cash to other people to allow you to cash out, to sell the company to somebody else, to, right, it's about uh, to generate just, you know, shareholder earnings. That's siphoning fuel. And if that's really the point, then you ultimately are on the built to flip side. If the point is the built to last side, I want to, you know, I really want this flywheel to go to a billion turns and 10 billion turns and continue to do great things for the world. Then all that is about taking as much of that fuel as possible to fuel the next clicks on the flywheel, next clicks on the flywheel. And the fundamental existential question, people talk about purpose. We discovered purpose many years ago in our research, but this is sort of the operational version of that. Where's the fuel going? Is the truth that you want to generate a flywheel that generates fuel that you siphon off or use as a flip? Or are you generating fuel to ultimately make the flywheel bigger, more powerful, greater momentum, doing better things in the world, and lasts a really long time? I think that's a great place to end this conversation, Jim. I really appreciate you taking the time and explaining it, and I think it's a perfect, perfect point to leave on. Till next time. Well, <laughs> I have this feeling that there will be a next time. I I'm, uh, so. I'm heading into my, uh, into my, um, into my research cave. And, uh, now, you know, I, I feel really grateful for, for bringing out, uh, this, this re-release of Beyond Entrepreneurship to bring Bill to the world. And thank you for letting me share Bill with your listeners. I, I just, just bringing Bill to people is very meaningful to me. And, and now I'm going into my research cave. Uh, I'm going to be working on my self-renewal research. And um, I, I do think of it as I'm at sort of at the midpoint of my career. I'm only 62. And if I've got good genes, you know, I should be basically 30 years into a 60-year arc. And that's a big if, right, on genes. But I don't know if I – good luck and all that kind of stuff. But if I get that – and I'm turning to these new questions. So um, although there's lots of other stuff we could talk about. So I'll, I'll be back. Uh, but for a while, I'm going to be a nice Enneagram 5 after I uh, get this out in the world and hiding in my cave. Thank you. I can't wait to see you on the other side. <laughs> Very good. Thank you again. Really, really joyful to spend time with you.